Good afternoon, everyone. I think we'll make a start. Um, so welcome everyone to this session, which is on regulatory and HDA assessment, a critical step in delivering innovation for patient benefits. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone and also to my fellow presenters today. So I'm joined um, by uh, my colleague, Jacqueline Abouve, who is a senior scientific advisor in the NICE's um, science policy and research team. Um, so Jacqueline works on several pan-European research projects, um, including Roadmap, which you'll be talking about this afternoon, as well as the Eden and Neuronet projects. Um, we also are joined by uh, Jill Farad, who is a global medical leader for neurology at GE Healthcare Life Sciences. Um, and Jill does research in neurology and clinical trials and is the project leader on AMIPAD. Um, and that's a consortium that's examining the value of amyloid PET imaging in dementia, as well as studying risk factors and biomarkers across the whole cognitive spectrum. And Jill's going to be talking today about her experiences on AMIPAD on uh, regulatory and HTA interactions. And then finally, we're joined by Marco Vicciconte, and he is a professor of industrial bioengineering at the University of Bologna. Um, recently, Marco's main research focus has been in the regulatory science needed to assess the validity and credibility of digital health um, and in silico medicine technologies. Um, and Marco leads the uh, regulatory work package in the Mobilise D consortium. And he'll be talking today about their strategy, uh, regulatory strategy for the qualification of dis digital outcomes from wearable sensors. And then finally, myself, I'm going to be presenting today so, um, about the work of the Neuronet um, Regulatory and HTA Liaison Working Group. Um, I work with Jacqueline at NICE and I'm a senior analyst in the science policy and research team. And I also work on some IMI uh, pan-European research projects including Neuronet and the Roadmap project. Um, so I will be beginning presentations. So I will share my screen. Um, so today um, I'm going to do a brief overview just of the Neuronet working groups, um, but more specifically we're talking about the HDA and regulatory interactions working group, which is set up under the Neuronet project. Um, so talking about some of the membership, aims and objectives, and some of the overview of our discussions and outputs. And then finally, I'm going to be presenting about one of the outputs that we've delivered so far, and that's our um, regulatory and HDA engagement decision tool. Um, so just beginning talking about the working groups, um, the, as, when Neuronet was a set up, um, it was set up which to include uh, four thematic working groups which would be formed of experts who from the projects that make up the Neuronet portfolio. Um, the four working groups are those listed on the left, so obviously the HDA and regulatory interactions group, also data sharing, ethics and patient privacy and sustainability. And those areas were chosen really um, in consultation with the um, Neuronet um, projects as areas that the projects would um, need and appreciate further support on. Um, the working groups are really intended to be um, spaces for discussion between the projects, so talking about the project's experiences, the challenges and needs and bottlenecks that they've experienced, any particular lessons learned, to debate hot topics in those areas and also to help Neuronet to identify areas for future synergy and collaboration across the portfolio. And in terms of outputs, really it's around developing tools and guidance that can be used by the projects across the portfolio in those particular areas to help reduce duplication so we're not, each project isn't doing the same thing over and over again, and also to provide an area for networking across the different projects. Um, so in terms of our particular working group, um, it's chaired by NICE um, and we have um, a few projects represented, so they're the ones um, listed on the right hand side. Um, the membership is flexible though, so we really welcome um, any projects that are interested in joining and sharing their experiences. Um, but we also have the ability to invite particular experts from outside of Neuronet to specific meetings where, where applicable. Um, so the aim of the working group really is to think about what are the insights that are specific to neurodegenerative diseases in relation to the um, um, regulatory and HGA engagement, so the challenges that are unique to those diseases. 
And as I mentioned, one of the things that we want to do is to develop tools to support projects when they're engaging with the regulatory and HGA bodies. Um, so I've worked with the projects to think about if they've got any specific needs or knowledge gaps in relation to particular procedures or where they might want some um, external expertise in relation to specific questions. Also to provide a, share, a forum so we can share those lessons across different projects and we can help to capture those um, in order to support the projects where applicable in developing strategies for regulatory HDA and, and payer engagement. Um, so we've had two meetings um, to date, so um, we've had a couple of meetings but really focused on what are the particular areas for future discussion and output. Um, and then the second meeting we presented at the decision tool, which I'll be coming on to shortly. Um, so some of the areas that we really talked about in something that we could look at within the working group were around developing guidance so that we can engage, um, projects can engage effectively with HTAs and regulators when they're designing their clinical studies. So what are the things that they need to think about? Um, we can use it as an opportunity to share le learning and best practice across the portfolios so we can learn from where projects have already engaged with those bodies. We talked about having dedicated meetings, so we might invite external ex expertise in relation to specific questions that the projects have. So what's looking at what the added value of joint HTA and national HTA advice, um, scientific advice might be, looking particularly at how um, patient engagement in those processes as well. Um, and we also talked about having informal opportunities to engage with bodies such as HTA agencies. And one of the things that we'll be looking to produce at the end of the um, Neuronet project is a white paper that's on the challenges that are faced when um, projects are engaging with regulatory and HDA agencies. And so we can kind of develop some lessons learned that can be carried forward um, by other projects in the future. Um, so thinking about the tools to support engagement, as I said, one of the key things that we hope to do is to develop tools to support engagement with these bodies. Um, so one of our first outputs has been a regulatory and HGA engagement decision tool. Um, so thinking about the context behind that tool, um, we know that regulators have an important role in um, assessing the quality and safety and efficacy of new drugs when they're developed. HGA bodies look at clinical and cost effectiveness and payers look at um, ensuring access to healthcare and support for people with neurodegenerative diseases. Um, we know that some of the outputs from IMI projects may be relevant to these stakeholders and what, what we really wanted to do was try to support those projects so to maximise the impact and relevance of these outputs when they're engaging with these stakeholders and to think about how they can, um, how their requirements of these stakeholders can be included in their evidence development strategies. So what we wanted to do was to develop a tool that could help people to engage at the right time with the right processes and procedures along the whole medicines development approval and reimbursement pathway. Um, what we've developed is um, was for use by the IMI neurodegenerative portfolio but in its current format is widely applicable um, and we have got some next steps identified to make it a bit more specific to neurodegenerative diseases which I'll come on to shortly. So this is what the tool looks like. Um, it's colour coded. Um, so in the top half of the tool, we, we show the different stages of development of an asset. So um, from early development, um, preclinical through to phase one and then through to um, post um, marketing authorization at the end. Um, and we show how those are related to the different stages of engagement with different bodies. So we've got early, mid and late engagements. And then in the bottom half, we talk about it's an overview of the key processes and procedures that are available. So these are color coded. So the ones in pink relate to regulators. We've got a purple, which are a more HTA focused. And then these lilac color is joint or parallel procedures. Um, so it's, it's interactive in the sense that um, each of the processes and procedures, if you click on it, um, provides a little bit more information about that particular um, process um, but it also signposts for further information so it looks something like this 
Um, it's a web-based tool, so it's currently available on the Neuronet Knowledge Base, which is available to um, people who sit on the uh, Neuronet projects. Um, although there is some discussion around making that site uh, publicly available. So this is the kind of thing it looks like if you're on if you're online looking at it. As I said, you can uh, it gives a little bit of information and then you can click on the links where it takes you to further information about that particular procedure. So thinking about the next steps for um, for the decision tool. So as I said, it's, it's already available in the knowledge base, but it would be good to make it more widely available so more people are able to see and use it. Um, we also talked about making it a bit more specific to, to Neuronet in terms of the projects. So we wanted to include some case studies from the Neuronet projects. So thinking about what the challenges and lessons learned from those projects are, where they've engaged with HTA and regulatory procedures. Um, so that's something that we're going to be taking forward um, very soon. Um, we also talked about signposting to more detailed publish um, ND guidance. So, for example, you know, there's a number of different qualification of null and qualification advice relating to Alzheimer's, for example. So how we can signpost to those. So they're all in one place for people to read. Um, also around expanding it to other regulatory regions. So, for example, Canada. So where there's been some joint processes and parallel procedures between, um, for example, um, bodies in Europe and in Canada or, for example, with the FDA. And then finally, we talked about making it a little bit more um, sort of specific to the user. So perhaps think about some of the key questions that developers might have so that they, they might produce a directory of different routes for engagement depending on what those particular questions are. And But of course we're welcome to any other ideas that people think might be useful or where um, they think we can develop it further. Um, so that's just a, a very quick overview of what we've been doing in our working group. So if you are interested in getting involved, we'd be very interested in having you um, involved in the working group. But also, if you've got any ideas for how we can look at developing the decision tool further, then please get in touch. There's my email. But we also have the opportunity to ask questions towards the end of this session. Thank you very much. Just bear with me. Um, so I'm going to hand over to my colleague Jacqueline. She's going to talk about the roadmap project. So over to you, Jacqueline. Thanks, Diana. I'm just going to share my slide. I'm really happy to be talking about the roadmap project and specifically the work that we did within the roadmap project that really looked at regulatory and health technology assessment or HDA um, considerations in the context of using real world evidence um, to support uh, new treatments for, for Alzheimer's disease. So within the roadmap project, um, NICE was co-leading a work package on regulatory and HDA, HDA engagement. Um, just go to the next slide. So roadmap, and it's really quite nice to be talking about roadmap today because it's a project that has finished um, it, it, towards the end of 2018. And the roadmap project really was about exploring real world evidence and real world data um, across the Alzheimer's disease spectrum um, and looked at different data sources. Um, you can see the acronym there, you can see we pushed it a tiny bit with uh, making it fit a nice roadmap, <laughs> roadmap acronym. Um, but it really was about exploring uses of real world evidence in in Alzheimer's disease. And the way that it did that was that it looked at um, the, uh, lots of different data sources and different types of data, data sources. So roadmap combined data or had access um, to data from clinical trials, but also electronic health records, hospital data sets, um, and patient and disease registries. Um, and in those data sets, what we explored was what outcomes and what variables about um, uh, people with Alzheimer's disease and their carers were being captured in these different data sources. And we looked at those outcomes um, across the entire spectrum of disease. So starting at prodromal AD and mild cognitive impairment, kind of through the, through the different, different disease stages. 
And what you see here is an early kind of conceptualization of something that we call the data cube, because within the roadmap, um, we actually developed um, a data cube, which you can see, which is still accessible on this, on this address. And what you can really explore there is all of these different data sources, the outcomes that are being kept, that have been captured in those, in those data sources. And um, in what disease stages, different outcomes have been, have been measured. So if you want to take a look at the, the data cube, you can find it, you can find it at this address. Um, so what is the relevance of that for from a regulatory and an HDA perspective? So when we think about the potential for a new Alzheimer's uh, drug, um, regulatory agencies, as Diana briefly mentioned, are responsible for providing uh, marketing authorization. So that's the European Medicines Agency uh, for Europe or the MHRA for the UK. So you can a company can can receive a, a, a license to market a product if there are sufficient evidence of the quality safety and efficacy of the drug and efficacy in this context means is there enough evidence that the product works but when it comes to um, having people having access to treatments in in most publicly funded healthcare systems um, payers and HDA bodies will need to also consider the relative effectiveness, sometimes cost effectiveness and affordability and budget impact of, of new treatments. And the way that they do that is not only considering whether the drug works, but also how well it works compared to what's already available and depending on, on the decision maker also whether or not it provides value for money. Um, so, Within Roadmap, we set up an expert advisory group um, of regulatory and HDA experts. Um, and they came from different kind of different European countries. So they represented different jurisdictions and different perspectives on how added benefit and, and cost effectiveness of, of, of treatments is, is considered. And what we did throughout the course of the project is that they met with uh, the project um, work packages that were working on things like priority outcomes, uh, disease progression modeling or health economic modeling. And what they did is that they provided the researchers um, within the project with feedback and input on the relevance and some considerations that were specific to, um, to, to the work that was being done in the regulatory and HCA context. And what I want to talk through today are some of the key, key lessons learned and key recommendations that came out of those, those, those exact, um, or expert advisory group discussions with, with the researchers in the roadmap project. So one of the key recommendations and, and what we identified is that um, we will need real world evidence thinking about a potential new Alzheimer's drug um, to support health economic modeling assumptions. So it already is quite common um, to use real world evidence in support of, of, of clinical trial data to look at, for example, correlations between different disease stages and endpoints, but also to, um, to, to get insight into resource impact and cost of, cost of treatments because clinical trial data tends to be not very representative of, and it's quite an artificial um, environment as compared to uh, cost and, and resource use in kind of clinical, everyday clinical practice. So there already are kind of established and accepted uses of real world evidence, especially in the, in the HDA, uh, HDA player context. Um, but something that we also, so when we think about the evidence needs for, for HDA purposes, an HDA body will be interested in seeing the impact and the potential outcomes over a long time horizon of, of, of a new treatment. And what that means is that it will be important to um, measure how people who receive treatment with a certain, with a certain therapy how their disease progresses and how um, and what the treatment effect might be in, in, in clinical practice. And clinical trials will have a relatively short treatment duration. So we will need information about kind of the longer term, the longer term impacts um, on, 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 on disease for, for people who are treated with, with, with therapy. But what we saw in when we when roadmap was mapping out the um, 
looking at these different data sets and what data and what, what um, outcomes were being used is that in clinical endpoints that were being used and the, the instruments to measure endpoints in trials, such as the ADAS COG or the um, CDR SOP, um, and, and the assessments that are used in clinical practice. So when a person goes to their GP or goes to a memory clinic and what, what instruments are being used there to assess function and cognition, they tend to overlap somewhat, but there are big differences. And we also see quite a lot of regional variation in what countries different instruments tend, tend to be used. And what that introduces is quite some uncertainty and variation about how someone's um, disease progression as me measured by an instrument that's being used in the context of a clinical trial, how that maps onto um, how they then perform on clinical assessments that are used in, in, in normal clinical practice. And that can introduce uncertainty about some of the assumptions that you will need to make about how, how a disease progresses, especially when people receive treatment with a, with a new therapy. And another thing that was really identified by the work in, in, in Roadmap was that what we saw is that disease progression tends to not really be measured repeatedly in practice after an initial diagnosis. And that makes a lot of sense as well to me because once in clinical practice you've established a certain diagnosis, unless there's a real you know, urgent need to, to do another assessment, there, you might be able to track a disease progression in other ways. But that means, especially if you're going to be using electronic health records or, or real world data sources, that information that you might want to know from the perspective of, you know, what is the long-term treatment effect of a certain, certain therapy doesn't really match, match up with, with how, how data is actually being reported in, in clinical practice. So that was a, a gap that, that we saw there. Um, and when we were looking at priority outcomes, the roadmap did a quite a lot of work on, on, on this. Uh, the EXEG also identified that, especially in the earlier disease stages, where people don't have, have functional symptoms yet, but will have mild cognitive impairment, Given, given kind of the wide ranging nature of those, those symptoms, it would be really important to have outcome measures that are able to both distinguish between Alzheimer's and potentially other forms of dementia or other causes of mild cognitive impairment that don't have anything to do with neuro, neuro, neuro um, with Alzheimer's disease. Um, but also ones that actually are able to measure a delay in, in Alzheimer's disease onset and measuring a meaningful delay in Alzheimer's disease progression. And there are really quite some challenges, challenges there. So kind of finalizing, um, I think one of the things that I, uh, that I wanted to have a bit of a think about is kind of where, where, does, where does it take us? So we had the roadmap project, which was a two year project and end that ended in 2018. And although there was talk about potential roadmap too, um, uh, you know, that especially would focus on um, actually filling some of the gaps that roadmap identified that project never never um, never happened and we probably are now closer to a possible new Alzheimer's treatment than we were in 2018 which means that the priorities that we identified in roads roadmaps um, expert advisory group on regulatory and HDA considerations really remains unchanged um, and I'm going to leave it at that if you want some more information about the roadmap project um, or if you have any questions, put them in the chat box. Um, but you can find um, some publications from the project as well as the data cube at this, this address. Thanks. Thank you, Jacqueline. Okay, so I shall move on now. As an, if anyone has any questions, as um, Jacqueline says, if you could put those in the chat function and we'll come back to them at the end of the session. But I will hand over to Jill um, to talk about the Amipad project. Hi everyone, right, I'm gonna, okay. Thanks Jacqueline. Um, I was actually very interested to see what you were doing in Roadmap and I think Amipad is a great example of um, a project where we're discussing you know, the interactivity between the, the regulatory component and the HDA component. So I was very delighted to uh, give you guys an update on our lessons and reflections from the regulatory and HDA interactions from our AMIPAD program, which is 
amyloid imaging to prevent Alzheimer's disease. And I'll just give you a bit of background on the on the on the IMI project. It's um, a five year project, budget of 27 million distributed, and we're 15 partners, nine academic partners. Uh, three FPA partners, obviously we work very closely with Alzheimer Europe and some SMEs that do help us with our um, logistical and operational activities and we're now starting year five. Um, so just to give you guys a background, um, amyloid deposition, um, it starts many years before the onset of Alzheimer's disease symptoms. You've probably all seen these jack curves but I just thought I'd put everybody on the same page. Um, the line in blue is basically amyloid and that's what we're imaging this is the earliest pathological marker and that's followed by tire in red uh, neurodegeneration which can be measured by mri and ftg then finally cognitive impairment so hence the reason why we're interested in um, developing an agent for amyloid pets um, the diagnosis of alzheimer's disease it's changed uh, 1984 was the mccann criteria that was the initial sort of criteria that we all refer back to that had a very clinical component. There's now multiple biomarkers um, involved in the diagnosis of dementia. We have obviously amyloid markers, but we also have tau and neurodegeneration markers. You can see these um, examples of the biomarkers on the right hand side here. But um, what we're focusing on here is the earliest um, biomarker for Alzheimer's disease, which is amyloid. Um, I wanted to mention the landscape over the last six or seven years. Um, first thing is that um, the European Medical um, Agency and FDA have approved amyloid pet tracers. And as was mentioned, these, these were phase three autopsy validation studies. We basically showed that the amyloid pet was actually imaging the pathology of the that was actually in the brain and that there was a high accuracy that the PET scan related correlated very nicely with the, the pathology seen in the seen in the brain. However, as mentioned, there's further work needed to understand the diagnostic utility of these traces. So what? You, you know, you can image this, you can uh, basically do the scan, but what does it mean for the patient and the, uh, the diagnosis? Secondly, there's been a massive explosion of research studies using amyloid PET and other biomarkers, and especially in preclinical and early, early dementia. Um, many of the clinical studies that were performed, the therapeutic studies were performed in sort of mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease. This has come right now and um, come right back to earlier in the disease. You know, there's studies, the, uh, the Biogen study, for example, you can see on the right hand side, side was in mild cognitive impairment. And there's an awful lot of studies now in um, subjective cognitive decline, which is an even earlier phase, and preclinical dementia as well. And then, as was mentioned as well, if you look at number three, um, anti-amyloid therapies. Um, it, with Biogen, the Aducanumab, they've got their um, advisory committee meeting with FDA, I think, on the 6th of November. And I saw that there was a PDUFA date for potential approval of that product in, in March. So the use of tracers such as um, these PET tracers, uh, um, amyloid imaging agents, they're basically used to routinely enrich the studies. So basically you have to have a positive amyloid scan to get in the studies. And you can show on the, the data on this um, diagram here on number three actually shows target engagement. You can see with the highest dose, what's happening is that from a longitudinal perspective, the, um, the therapy is actually targeting amyloid and it's actually decreasing the amyloid load over time. So again, just wanted to give you a bit of landscape. So let's have a look at AMIPAD, what we're doing in AMIPAD. Well, we've got two studies to deliver on our objectives. And as I mentioned, it's been a five year program and we've just started our fifth year. So on the left hand side, you've got the diagnostic value study. So we're looking at the usefulness of beta amyloid imaging in, the, in looking at diagnostic certainty and patient management. Um, you can see we've got three arms to the study. We've got a very early um, PET scan. We've got a late PET scan. That's about a year later. And then we've got a free cho choice arm where the physician gets to choose at what point in the, the diagnostic workup does the uh, patient get the scan. We're focusing on three different groups, three different patient groups. We've got subjective cognitive decliners. These are the very early people. Um, that are pretend, that potentially have dementia. We've got mild cognitive impairment, and then we have Alzheimer's disease dementia. So that's basically just an overview of the diagnostic study. On the right-hand side, we've actually got a risk stratification study. This is a natural history study, and we're studying earlier subjects where the pathology is developing and aiming to do longitudinal measures. And if you look in the middle, um, that this is the sort of um, the analytical component of AMIPAD. 
what we're aiming to do is to basically develop um, a, um, accurate measures for monitoring treatment. So can we measure amyloid accurately and can we measure rates of change of amyloid accurately? So if you look at just here, summarizes the regulatory and HTA interactions that we've had with AMIPAD. So right at the beginning of um, Oct October 2016, we actually had a meeting with um, EMEA and um, HTA. We did a scientific advice where we invited um, the HTA body to join us. And what we're interested in was actually the design and the study design of our diagnostic study. And then in 2019, we've also had some um, additional feedback from EMEA, a scientific advice where we've looked at some more conceptual um, questions on labeling, therapy intervention, quantitation, et cetera. And I'll go into those in a bit more detail. And this slide just basically gives you an overview of what we've actually been doing in AMIPAD. So you can see that basically that it took some time to do protocol development and approvals. And then we've obviously started our diagnostic study here at the beginning of 2018. Um, recruitment is ongoing. It's actually going to be finishing at the end of October. And also our, our natural history study, again, that protocol took a lot of time to develop and that recruitment is ongoing. I've got some slides later in the talk just to show you where we are with the, the recruitment numbers. Okay, so this is the feedback from EMEA and NICE. And what I've done is rather than going through all of this in, in, in detail, just picking out some of the, uh, the interesting features of the different feedback between EMEA and NICE. Um, if you look at number two, um, both wanted to just, us to do subgroup analysis. So the AMIPAD program, we have two tracers. Um, we have two um, FPA partners. We've got Life and Molecular and we've got GE. So we're using Visimil and Neurosec in the study, and that's quite acceptable, but they would like to see some subgroup analysis. Number three, as I mentioned, we're recruiting subjective cognitive decliners as well as the more later stage mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer um, subjects. So both EMEA feedback and NICE feedback was obviously that subjective cognitive decline is less established. And we do need to be careful, for example, with respect to management. Um, there is also an ethics group and the impact of disclosure of a PET an amyloid PET scan is, a, is an area of research that's ongoing in the SCD group. The main interesting um, difference between the EMEA and NICE was basically if you look at the design and the primary hypothesis, this is number four. Um, the EMEA feedback was very much, they're interested in the diagnostic change in an MCI in the AD group. Um, that was the primary goal. And what they're interested in is basically making sure that we harmonize the, the position of the other biomarker tests so that we can actually test the influence of the PET tracer on the diagnostic workup of the uh, of the subject. Um, NICE was much more interested in a, a complete pathway of care. They wanted to see end-to-end -end studies, including survival preferably, and obviously wanted to look at the cost and resource utilization and the benefits from the practice um, of actually doing a PET scan relative to if you, if you weren't doing a PET scan. So there was actually quite a lot of differences between EMEA and NICE in terms of you know what they wanted to see in the design of this study. Um, again, the utility measures, both um, EMEA and NICE were interested in longer term follow up that was advised. Problem is, it's a five year study. We recruit, you know, we're just finishing recruiting now, and then we have a, a single year left to do, you know, to collect one year data. So from a sustainability perspective, and I think this is where Neuronet might come in, one of the things that we would like to do is to be able to, you know, what are the mechanisms to try and follow up those patients that are, that are in our clinical study? How can we do this? What level of information is required? Um, NICE had some interest in, obviously, um, health-related quality of life measures and those what we've tried to do is we've tried to incorporate some of the, the guidance from NICE actually into the design of our uh, study. If I just go to the next slide here, let, we can just actually have a look at the feedback that was implemented. I mean, what you think we have to sort of, what everybody has to understand is we've only got a certain budget. It would have been beautiful to have done the NICE study, which was an end-to-end -end survival study. But when you're starting with subjects who've got subjective cognitive decline, it might be 15 or 20 years from basically the initial diagnosis following them through their life. So 
we've had to sort of compromise um, and one, as I mentioned sustainability is something that we will be trying to sort of capture the project will be the fund the formal funding will be um, ending in a year's time but we obviously want to sort of generate some mechanisms and look at some opportunities to basically see if we can follow so just let's look at the feedback that we were able to implement um, and so using joint traces that's okay and as I mentioned subgroup analysis is important standardized methods of quantitative analysis for pooling results you can imagine that different pet traces have different kinetics different up, slightly different uptake parameters so we're having to develop some methodology in terms of normalizing the quantitative output and um, it was always mentioned by both groups that the subjective cognitive decline it's it's been a research group so far um, normally in clinical practice and um, mild cognitive impairment and alzheimer patients would actually go through to a memory clinic more and more subjective cognitive decline is being sort of recognized and therefore the advice was to be you know take care don't avoid over treatment in that group we were thinking about changing um, management which was what we primarily thought nice would want to see however obviously emia these the the study was actually designed to support a, an emia post approval commitment and therefore we did change the primary endpoint to look at the impact of um, pet change and diagnosis um, we were encouraged to include an endpoint relating to the enrollment of um, subjects into DND and therapy trials, obviously very important. Um, we weren't able to monitor progression from MCI. That wasn't included in the study, but we were re we recognised that um, following a longer term follow up would be important. So it is something that we are considering. So that was actually the first um, interact interaction that we had. The second interaction was more specific to EMEA. And again, I've got the full advice on the slide, but I'm just picking up some interesting features um, from this EMEA advice. As I mentioned, it was more, they, these were more sort of technical, logistical um, queries that we had for them rather than advice on designing the protocol. So the first one was the use of amyloid PET for therapy intervention and EMEA's recognize that a positive scan is used as one of the selection criteria for DMD research. Um, yes, we wanted to get some feedback from EMEA about the disease continuum because obviously Alzheimer's now is not just Alzheimer's disease, it basically extends right back to preclinical AD. Um, I think EMEA do accept the concept, but they obviously what they're saying is the value of PET in cognitively normal is still to be decided. Potentially, if somebody has an amyloid PET scan, they may, there's a certain risk to try and understand how they progress to um, Alzheimer's disease or else with that pathology. Image quantitation was, in, was, method, was um, mentioned, as we said in the first one, um, the first um, guidance. Because we're using two tracers, it's important to understand um, the methodology around how you measure um, the presence of amyloid. What happens normally when we do a um, the regulatory guidance is basically just to do a visual inspection. But what we want to do now is more add some quantitative tools as an adjunct to the ba basically the approved methods of image inspection. So that is something that's ongoing. And we do appreciate that quantitation that'll help with ther therapy selection, obviously development of cutoffs for amyloid sensitivity, because as we start to understand more and more about amyloid in the brain, we start to understand that even a small amount of um, pathology is, is relevant. Um, longitudinal imaging, it's important. Um, again, the question is, we, um, we asked about the value of longitudinal imaging, but the feedback was obviously need more evidence that changes in amyloid load could indicate disease progression. And that I think that evidence will come potentially once um, we've got information from our Amipad consortium, but also when there are disease modifying drugs out there and they're being used. We introduced the concept of a centeloid method. This is number four. And it was, we also, we used the scientific advice as a means to sort of introduce concepts to the regulators. And they were interested to understand that concept as they hadn't heard about it before. And it is actually globally used this centeloid concept. So that was a nice piece of work um, to, to do that with EMEA. And then obviously what we introduced finally was um, the prognosis, the fact that the amyloid can be used as a biomarker, but you know, it has prognostic 
use, surrogate use in a trial, potential predictive use to show therapy response. And obviously they are interested in this, the fact that these you know, amyloid can be used in these as a biomarker, but what they want to see is, is more data depending on the relationship between cognition and amyloid change, which again will come once these therapies are available. So very, very useful to get um, both sets of scientific advice and obviously the feedback from NICE as well. So just to just a final few slides, just wanted to show everybody where we are mid-October. Unfortunately, we were so we were aiming for 900 subjects. Unfortunately, COVID-19 hit us badly. We were on perfect track to meet our timelines to actually get our full 900 subjects in clinical practice by June. We've extended our um, recruitment to end of October and we're hoping for about 830. You can see that the major um, subjects that are recruited into the clinical trial are actually in, in the MCI, this is the mild cognitive impairment bracket. And that actually goes to show where the value of the, 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 the agent is, because basically um, mild cognitive impairment is the, um, the therapy, is the, is the patient group that, see, that goes most often to the, the memory clinic. So we'll nearly meet our um, recruitment targets, but we'll have about 830, and we'll start doing the analysis on that data. Um, we did, we were cognizant of the, the advice from NICE and obviously the, the request to basically get um, resource utilization to understand what the cost benefit of measuring amyloid PET is. So we are collecting some patient diaries. We've got 1300 so far and the aim is to collect 1600. It's a massive body of data. And in, within that patient diary, there's gonna be um, different questions on, for example, you know, have you been admitted to a hospital? How many nights did you spend in the hospital? What um, outside the hospital? What sort of care have you received? That was question 16. I just took some snapshots from the from the whole of the diary. Um, did you stay in any other institutions other than a hospital? What what medications are you on? And then there are there's a second section in the diary analysis which relates to um, the care activities of the carer and questions relating to, for example, um, you know, did you have to stop your um, your job? Did you have to, you know, how much time is it taking looking after this person, etc. So that resource utilization, as I mentioned, we've got six. We're expecting sixteen hundred of these diaries. The diaries are actually being collected in the um, the pet arm and the, the late pet arm, and they're basically been collected. I think there's four diaries for every single person. So that's going to be collected at uh, zero, three, six, and 13 months. So there'll be a very extensive um, body of data available for resource utilization. And hopefully this data could be available for everyone to, to mine once we've done the primary uh, data analysis in our annual pad component. And then the final slide that I've got, again, the natural history study, we were hoping to recruit a couple of thousand subjects. We've now actually got, unfortunately, 600 subjects. We're going to extend, hopefully, the recruitment till the middle of next year. You can see that flat curve, unfortunately, flattening off in February, March this year, where we didn't recruit anybody in March, April, May, June. It's slightly picked up, um, but it's not. Um, actually the clinical study has picked up more than the natural history study the research and um, study and I think that's because our research participants are sort of a bit reticent to go to the clinics for um, cognitive function tests and scans so just my personal reflections on the interactions with EMEA and HTA some similar advice for primary diagnosis um, advice around subjective cognitive decline and possible follow-up um, some advice was contrary for the diagnostic study. Um, EMEA were interested in measuring the impact of the initial diagnosis versus NICE's end-to-end -end study request. Um, we did actually invite the, um, all of the HTA bodies in Europe. NICE accepted to join, and I think the Swedish TLD, they listened in, but they didn't contribute. But NICE were actually very, I would say, proactive in giving us their two pennies worth of what they thought about the value of amyloid imaging was and how we could sort of generate extra value. EMEA, they gave us valuable guidance on study design and endpoints. And our secondary endpoints have added resource utilization by the diary work. 
And as I mentioned, um, both groups would like to see longer term follow up. They want to see, you know, the relationship between the amyloid PET scan and the potential for cognitive decline and where, where the patient ends up. So we will be discussing sustainability measures with, within Amipad and hopefully in Neuronet as well. And as I mentioned, finally, the second scientific advice was an, op an opportunity to introduce new concepts to EMEA, for example, the centeloid um, measurement quantitation um, measure that they hadn't, they weren't aware of. So that's just to say thank you from our Amipad group. And that was our fourth General Assembly meeting in Barcelona. We had a lovely time. And unfortunately, last week we had our virtual General Assembly, which was two days on, on the computer. So uh, thanks very much, everyone. And I hope that was sort of gives you an example of the projects that are ongoing. We're finishing our projects. So there's a lot of work now to do the analysis, um, modeling. So if anybody's interested to sort of understand a bit more, we've got a website, Amipad, and Cindy, who works um, for Alzheimer Europe, she does a lot of communication work and helps us too. So great. Thank you. Thanks, Jill. That's really interesting. All right. Thank you. And as I said earlier, if you've got any questions, just pop them in the chat. Um, but I'll quickly move over um, to Marco um, for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I'm going to tell you about some early work that we've been doing in the regulatory space uh, uh, in the Mobilized project. Um, one word about Mobilized. Mobilized is uh, a five years large IMI funded project that aims to produce validated and accepted digital mobility outcomes um, to be used to evaluate mobility in patients uh, affected by chronic conditions such as COPD, Parkinson, multiple sclerosis, recovery from hip fracture and congestive heart failure. Um, at the center of the project, there is this technology, this wearable sensor that are technically known as inertial measurement unit. Uh, to be precise, these are not sensor, but they are packages containing up to nine different miniaturized sensors uh, into a very small box that can be fixed uh, in various parts of the body of the patient. Um, here you see some of the typical location, uh, uh, like, the, like the belt buckle uh, in the front of the back, uh, and the ankles uh, or the wrist, etc. cetera. Uh, each of these nine sensors produce during level walking, for example, signals like you see here. Uh, and so it is absolutely important, uh, uh, the other part of the technology, which is a software, which take all this raw data and produce quantification of digital mobility outcome, like the average walking speed, the cadence, the step length, and so on. Um, this type of technology has two possible pathways from a regulatory point of view. So if the sensor is to be used to support the medical decision and the treatment of a patient, the, the device is seen as a medical device. Uh, it needs to be seen marked. And in this case, the, the regulatory pathway is pretty well defined. Uh, even if you separate the software from the hardware, now there is a, a well-defined regulatory pathway known uh, software as a medical device. So uh, this, this is pretty clear. What remains still to be understood is where and how you can use this sensor in the context of uh, clinical trials for pharmaceutical products. Okay? And this is where I'm going to focus my attention. Um, there's very little about uh, IMU in, in direct trials, in regulatory direct trials. Um, we found only three uh, formal uh, opinions from the regulatory agency. The first was a submission done by a German company, Trium, a while ago, uh, with a letter of intent to the FDA in the US, um, where they set a fairly ambitious goal, which was to position real world mobility construct measured with the inertial uh, measurement unit as a clinical endpoint on its own, okay? The reply of FDA uh, set a very high 
level of evidence, which is typical for, for clinical endpoints, okay? And as far as we know, this hasn't had any follow-up so far. Um, on the other extreme, there are two qualification opinion from EMA, one uh, very, very narrow and very, very specific uh, for an application related to the and muscular dystrophy, um, which had being a rare disease as also a very special status. And the other achieved by another AMI project called Proactive, where um, the sensor were used into a combined score where clinician scoring and patient report and outcome were combined into a single score called PPAC. Um, so all of this previous experience are, are, are very, either very broad, but they didn't come to a, a full qualification opinion or they're very narrow, very limited. Um, the trajectory you need to qualify a new methodology with EMA uh, is highlighted here. And, um, but in, in the point that we started to make very early with, with EMA is that these are complex digital technologies. So beside the clinical validation, we feel that it's very important um, to have also a technical validation, okay? And, and, and so we have developed a full technical validation. Um, because the scope of the qualification advice was very large and complex, it was agreed in an early stage of interaction with the EMA to separate, to split it in three consecutive stages, okay? Um, so the idea, the fundamental idea uh, that we are uh, leveraging on with our regulatory strategies is this. Essentially today in drug trial, uh, mobility is uh, observed in terms of mobility capacity. So the ability of someone to move, for example, six minute, six minute walking test, uh, or in terms of mobility perception, typically with a patient reported outcome, okay? Now, a lot of literature has highlighted uh, the limits uh, of this, uh, two uh, type of biomarkers. Uh, capacity does not necessarily imply that you actually move. The fact that you can move doesn't mean that you will move. And um, the, um, the perception of the patient uh, about their mobility can be considerably biased in a number of situations. So um, we proposed that uh, there is a need for a third biomarker about mobility, which, is, which we call mobility performance, which is actually the overall amount of mobility and intensity of mobility that the patient perform over a sufficiently long period, such as a week, in the real world. And in order to measure this, you need to develop and use wearable sensors. Of course, this method needs to be simply accurate, accurate, affordable, and works, most important, in real world conditions, okay? Not in a lab, but back home and during the daily life. So this is the stage of the approach we, we devised with EMA um, in order to tame the complexity. So first we, we introduced this general idea this construct, new construct of mobility performance to complement capacity and perception. Um, then we separate them in three stages, and for each stage, we ask for qualification advice. So the first we submitted a while ago was uh, a context of use where the digital mobility outcome was positioned to monitor uh, the progression of a single disease. Parkinson's disease. Now we are currently engaged with uh, a second submission. Actually, we have the, the final meeting with the Scientific Advisory Working Party in a week from now, uh, where we extend this to multiple diseases. And then there will be a third submission later on, where we will uh, explore the possibility of using digital mobility outcome as surrogate biomarkers of uh, relevant clinical endpoints. Um, 
So, uh, as I said, we started with uh, a first qualification advice uh, on the use of digital mobility outcomes as monitoring biomarkers in Parkinson's disease. Um, and, and now we are working on this second qualification advice where uh, we are asking for the extension of the advice on the possibility to extend this to COPD, multiple sclerosis and uh, proximal femur fracture. And then uh, on the possibility to explore uh, the use of a single DMO as disease independent monitoring biomarker. Um, and last, the possibility of using digital mobility outcome as surrogates of specific uh, 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 endpoints. Um, as I said before, the chain here is complex. So it is necessary to start with the technical validation that evaluate the sensor and the software layered in terms of precision and accuracy. And only later on, you can perform a clinical validation where you evaluate the appropriateness and the validity of the biomarker with respect to selected endpoints. Uh, and this, of course, requires you specify a context of views uh, and how this context of views uh, is involved in the final decision or, or around the marketing authorization of a new drug. Uh, I keep saying generically uh, digital mobility outcome. This is because our work plan uh, implies that we will measure a, a number of different digital mobility outcomes and then we will select them. So starting from the qualification advice that I expect to complete, we expect to complete, as I said, in, in a few weeks, um, we will start, uh, actually, we already started the technical validation. And then uh, in a few months, we'll start the clinical validation. Uh, for each context of use, we will have a number of candidate digital mobility outcomes. Of course, some will not perform well in the technical validation and they will be discarded. Uh, the other will be assessed during the clinical validation and uh, hopefully a winner will emerge for each of the four disease and this, this winners will be the center of our request for qualification opinion. Um, there might be the possibility that the winner is the same for all four diseases, in which case there could be the possibility to explore this idea of a disease independent uh, biomarker. Um, just a word about the technical validation, although I, I understand that this problem is not uh, the main focus of this uh, discussion group today, but um, we're using a metrology approach. So the idea is what is the most accurate way to measure movement. Well, this can be done in a laboratory using something called stereophotogrammetric analysis or more commonly gait analysis. Okay. Um, gait analysis has an accuracy of about uh, one millimeter and 10 milliseconds. So uh, it's very accurate in, in measuring movement. So using gait analysis as a true value, we will validate uh, an intermediate system, which is a wearable system. It's composed by um, two MMU, uh, three MMU uh, at, the, at, the, at the two ankles at the center of the body, plus two distance sensor and two pressure insoles. Uh, the combination of all these sensors provide a very accurate measurement, but of course, this is all too cumbersome for a clinical trial, typically a drug trial. So, uh, we will use this only in the technical validation to test uh, uh, with a more accurate measurement in the real world, so walking around the city in various conditions, the actual single sensor that we will use then in the clinical trial. Uh, with respect to the, the, the regulatory approach we propose to EMA in the first submission, uh, essentially for each disease we identify a primary holistic score um, for Parkinson, it was uh, MDS, UPDRS uh, in its various components, okay? And, and we go through the whole di discussion about construct validity, predictive capacity, and ability to detect change. 
the very same scheme as now being proposed for the other three diseases, of course, choosing a scale, a disease-specific scale as a primary comparison. Um, sorry, but I have these messages that keep appearing on my screen. Um, with respect to the disease-independent monetary biomarker, there are three possible situations. The first is that when we finish the validation, for all four diseases, the best performing digital mobility outcome will be the same. And then it will be a very easy to make a case that, uh, you know, probably that digital mobility outcome is the best candidate for other diseases as well. The second option is that our assumption is wrong. So every disease has a completely different uh, DMO as bad performer. But there might be a third case where the DMO are similar uh, uh, across diseases, but not exactly the same. So in this case, we need a disease independent scale. And what we are proposing to the EMA is to use the late life function and disability instrument. This is a, a scale that was developed in the context of geriatrics, but now is being used across different diseases. And we believe it could be a good independent scale for doing this validation. Um, then there is the, the, the last context of use, the one about using the DMO as a surrogate biomarker. Um, this is change for, for the disease. So in the case of Parkinson and multiple sclerosis, the, the goal is to predict uh, falls, which are uh, a very important component in these diseases. Um, for hip fracture, we're trying to predict the admission to nursing home. And in COPD, we will try to predict the uh, occurrence of severe exacerbations. Uh, so in summary, we got a first positive qualification advice for the use of digital mobility outcome for monitoring, uh, for monitoring Parkinson's disease. I, we're fairly optimist that soon we will get a similar positive qualification advice also for the other three diseases for the same type of context of use. We are engaging in an intense conversation <laughs> with EMA about the other two contexts of you. So it's very, it's too early to anticipate what the outcome will be. Um, last word, um, if you're interested to follow up what's going on in Mobilize D, uh, but also to discuss uh, with your um, peers about their common experience on regulatory uh, processes related to digital technology, I would invite you to subscribe uh, to this new uh, co online community of practice um, in Silico World. Uh, follow the link, uh, it's free, open to everyone. There is a specific channel that we created in collaboration with IMI and FPIA called uh, Digital Health for Trials, which specifically discuss about the regulatory issue of digital health technology to be used in regulatory clinical trials. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marco. That was really interesting. Um, we've got a few minutes for any questions now. So if I invite the other panel members back on. Right. Um, I don't think we've had any questions in the chat yet. So if anyone wants to add any in, that'd be brilliant. Thank you. Um, but I thought it was really interesting to hear about kind of the different perspectives from um, sort of more like the more kind of general um, discussions that we had within Roadmap around kind of um, more kind of um, like looking at outcomes more generally to how it's actually kind of being used within the different projects like AmiPAC and, and Mobilize D. Um, I've got a couple of questions just before anyone else has any. Um, so my first one really was um, to, to, to Jacqueline. Um, I was thinking about sort of the different needs between um, regulatory and HGA bodies and it kind of links a little bit to what Jill was talking about when you kind of got different sort of feedback from the different bodies. So in terms of um, the findings from Neuronet, what were the sort of key differences in terms of uh, real world evidence needs between the two um, different stakeholders that were identified by roadmap, would you say? Great question. <laughs> Jill's slide showed that, I think, quite well. Is that HDAs tend to be interested in the stuff that the regulators are interested in, but they tend to have additional evidence considerations. Um, and a key interest will be in 
kind of the long-term outcomes for, for people who receive treatment and how that might impact clinical practice. So that has to do with tracking and making assumptions if there is uncertainty or only a short, relatively short duration of a trial, for example. You need to make certain assumptions about how, how, how people who are receiving treatment, what their long-term outcomes mm -hmm. might be. It's just difficult, so difficult from a financial perspective if you've only got a window of five years and it takes two years to get the whole thing started and um, you know, to do an end-to-end -end survival study is quite a, an undertaking, yeah. both technically and sort of financially as well. So, yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and I think HCA bodies um, will look at the cost impact, both cost, additional costs and cost of treatment, but also potential cost savings. Mm. If you have a treatment, that means that people, you know, are receive um you know um ho less hospital treatment or are less likely to receive kind of institutionalized care um those can be potential savings mm -hmm. which is what so, we were hoping to do with the diary analysis so, so hopefully mm -hmm. i mean there'll be a body of data that you know if I, and i guess we can discuss from a neuronet perspective that that data might become available for other people to do their own research research projects as well so but marco yeah. i thought your project your project sounds really interesting as well and Question, can I ask Marco a question? Certainly, go ahead. <laughs> Basically, Marco, these, you're not diagnosing Parkinson's with your device, are you? You're basically pre predicting an event that's going to happen within an already diagnosed Parkinson's patient or potentially have these devices got the ability to d differentially diagnose patients or is it more helping to no, the intent uh, the intent is not diagnostic it, yeah this is being raised actually uh, in the discussion with ema yeah we have to be very clear it's not absolutely not diagnostic yeah but but the question is you know this this progressive disease have a progressive degradation of the the mobility mm. so you literally talk about mobility disability okay mm. and this has a huge impact on the quality of life of, of the patient, as you all know, I was I was listening to the discussion of the HTA. It's very interesting because uh, you know we're making this this request to EMA to give us qualification advice about the use of this sensor to obtain um, a surrogate, for example, to predict earlier admission to home care in hip fractures. And the first reaction of EMA expert was, "Oh, but we don't care. This is not about the efficacy of the drug." Which might be true, but but I think in the when we talk about HDA, then that will become mm -hmm. very important because mm -hmm. the the overall management of the patient changes dramatically the day that he has to be admitted in yeah. care. So th this this territory between regulatory and HDA is complex, and you know uh, maybe this idea of the early advice should be rediscussed and and, and put in a broader perspective than it was originally because mm. as it is it doesn't work to solve this problem in my opinion. Marco can I ask you a question about your your talk as well because I was also really interested in, in in seeing the work that you've been doing and I wondered whether the development of the of the sensor as a digital endpoint it, are you primarily thinking about using this in the context of a clinical trial or is it also something that you might be able to use kind of in normal everyday clinical practice would it be, would it be functional absolutely. in that setting as well yes it, it, it actually this is this is the most likely use um but it's not interesting from a regulatory point of view as it was explained because it, in that case, the, the regulatory pathway is very well established. Actually, the, one of the sensors was showing the McRoberts, it's already C market. So mm -hmm. you, you can use in your clinical practice without any problem, you know. Um, the real challenge is to have this measurements, this digital mobility outcome accepted as biomarker mm -hmm. in the drug trial. That that is where mm -hmm. We're still discussing how to do, how to demonstrate the validity. Mm. So, so what you're saying is, for example, you wore, you, you could me do longitudinal measures with your mobility to show that if somebody had a rapid change in gait compared to if somebody was fairly stable, then that would be a surrogate for potential disease progression. Is that what you're trying to say? That is the most ambition. Uh, yeah. Well, so to position this as surrogate biomarkers. Yeah. 
there are, of course, we're this hypothesis don't come out uh, of the blue. There is uh, some some literature already that demonstrates, for example, in Parkinson, there is beautiful studies done, for example, by the group of our coordinator, Dean uh, Rochester in, in Newcastle, where they show that, um, for example, average walking speed in real world can be used as a predictor of the risk of falling. Um, in Parkinson patients, and now we need to validate this in a in a multicentric uh, regulatory valid uh, frame. But this, if this is confirmed, it would be very powerful, of course. Fortunately, we've actually come to the end of our time, I'm afraid. <laughs> but uh, that was really interesting, and it was really good to hear everyone's presentations. Um, we've not had any other questions, so I would like to thank all uh, my fellow panel members. Thank um, you, guys. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Oh, we might go to big rest. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye, -bye. Thank you. Bye everyone. Thank you all. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Uh, just to make a point that the recording of these sessions will be available on the conference platform. Um, until the end of the year so you can log back in and uh, re-watch the presentations if you want to thanks everyone for attending and hopefully see you in one of the next neonet sessions or in the plenary thank you thank you